Good morning. Uh, I'm Glenn Vanderberg. Um, thanks for coming. I'm here to talk about real software engineering. Uh, I'm told that uh, for video purposes I have to stay behind the podium, uh, which is not my usual mode of speaking. So if I wander off and you can't hear me anymore, uh, somebody wave me back over here. Um, I, uh, uh, this is a room full of software practitioners. So nobody here will be surprised to hear me say that uh, software engineering doesn't work. Um, this is widely known in our field. Uh, most of us who started out uh, and were educated as software developers, at least, um, went through a period where we were taught a set of practices uh, called software engineering. Um, some of us may have learned that on the job. Uh, if we started work at some place that cares about those sorts of things. And uh, it's widely acknowledged that those practices simply don't work in our field. Uh, the practices that we call software engineering, um, although they have changed over time, uh, they don't reliably control the costs of projects, they don't reliably produce software of high quality, and sometimes even when they're practiced rigorously by people who have good training in how to do it, uh, they don't succeed in producing software at all. But we should find it very surprising that this is the case. Because in every other field that aspires to the title of engineering, the term engineering is reserved for practices that work. In fact, that's as good a capsule definition of engineering, independent of any particular subspecialty, as you're likely to find those sets of practices and techniques that have been shown through experience to work reliably in that field. And yet in software development we have this uh, untenable situation where we have a set of practices that are known by the name software engineering and everybody who practices software development knows that those practices don't work. Um, this state of affairs is so strange and alarming that it has caused many people to question whether engineering is an appropriate metaphor for software development at all. Maybe software development just isn't engineering, maybe it's incompatible with engineering, maybe it's craft or uh, art or movie making or uh, theory building or something like that. And uh, uh, we need to just give up on the idea that software development is engineering. And I think that's silly. But it's easy to see how we would get to that point because um, those kinds of reactions spring from the same misunderstandings that led to the development of a flawed vision of software development in the first place. The people who created the field that we now call software engineering misunderstood two very important things, software development and engineering. And the result is that software engineering is really a caricature of an engineering discipline. And so, in this talk, I want to uh, take a brief look at where we went wrong, sort of how it's possible that a whole field stepped down the wrong path uh, and pursued a vision of engineering that, that was really flawed from the outset. Uh, and then I want to compare the caricature of engineering that we see in our field with what a real engineering discipline looks like. And finally, at the end, talk about uh, what software engineering would look like if we were to reinvent it um, based on a proper understanding of what engineering is. The term software engineering first started to be thrown about uh, at, in 1968 in Garmisch, Germany. Um, sorry, you can't see that very well, but um, it was a, a conference on software engineering uh, sponsored by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization of all people, um, to try to address what was perceived as the software crisis, or inability to manage software projects appropriately and, and produce reliable things. And um, being curious about software engineering and what the problem was, I uh, decided a few years ago, a couple of years ago, to go read the proceedings of that conference. And uh, given my attitude toward the field of software engineering, I fully expected to learn, you know, this is where the madness started. 
And I was surprised and kind of gratified to find that that wasn't the case at all. Um, really, if you read the proceedings, there's a lot of smart stuff in there. The participants in the conference came from academia and from industry and from uh, various organizations like Bell Labs that kind of straddle those two worlds. And um, a lot of them were practitioners. <coughs> and there were a few things said at that conference uh, that uh, I think don't make much sense to our ears today, but there was a lot of sense there as well. There were a lot of uh, smart things said. By far, the uh, prevalent tone of the conference was that there's a whole lot we just don't know about software and how it's developed and what software engineering might look like. There's a great deal of uncertainty about what it might mean to engineer software. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, in 1968, software development was a, a, a baby of an industry and uh, the tools and techniques and, and platforms we were building on were in enormous flux and it made perfect sense to have a lot of uncertainty. At the end of the conference, Alan Perlis uh, spoke and tried to summarize the few things that they had been able to agree on. And uh, in that very short statement, he talks about uh, iterative design. The vo vocabulary is very different, and he didn't call it that, but clearly he was talking about iterative design, starting with a system that was very small and did almost nothing but worked and gradually building on that and expanding it into the system you eventually wanted to have. And he spoke of driving that process through tests. It's no surprise that uh, everybody who participated in that conference was excited about the prospects and wanted to carry on the work. And so, in 1969, in Rome, there was a second software engineering conference, also sponsored by NATO. And if you go read the proceedings, it'll be clear that this, in fact, is where the madness started. Uh, the tone is very different. What happened in that year? Well, um, some of you may have seen me give this talk uh, elsewhere, an earlier version of this talk, and uh, it was at this point that I said, well, I don't know, and presented a humorous uh, explanation of what might have happened by looking at how Waterfall sort of inadvertently became the standard way of developing software. Um, uh, since that time, uh, somebody who heard my, my talk, uh, a guy named Zane Bitter, uh, a New Zealander, um, sent me a link to a very interesting resource. In 1996, there was a conference on the history of software engineering. And a gentleman named uh, Brian Randell, who co-edited both of these reports, his name that you can barely see there, um, wrote a reminiscence in 96 about these two conferences and the process of being involved in them and co-editing the two uh, reports about the conferences. And um, uh, like Dave Hoover yesterday uh, in his keynote, I'm a quotations geek. Uh, so I'm going to offer an extended quotation from Brian Randall's um, reminiscence about the second NATO software engineering conference. Unlike the first conference, at which it was fully accepted that the term software engineering expressed a need rather than a reality, in Rome there was already a slight tendency to talk as if the subject already existed. And it became clear during the conference that the organizers had a hidden agenda, namely that of persuading NATO to fund the setting up of an international software engineering institute. I suspected this much, but uh, it, was, it was amazing to see it confirmed uh, so starkly. However, things did not go according to their plan. The discussion sessions which were meant to provide evidence of strong and extensive support for this proposal were instead marked by considerable skepticism and led one of the participants, Tom Simpson of IBM, to write a splendid short satire on masterpiece engineering, which is worth seeking out, by the way. It's easy to find if you Google for it. It was little surprise to any of the participants in the Rome conference that no attempt was made to continue the NATO conference series. But the software engineering bandwagon began to roll as many people started to use the term to describe their work, to my mind, often with very little justification. 
It's pretty damning. Um, Randell, uh, for the next 25 years or so, declined to have anything to do with the software engineering movement and refused to participate in any event or uh, body of work that used that name. Um, what we see is uh, you know, a little bit academic empire building, you know? Um, if you've ever heard the quote, uh, how many of you have been involved in, in academia postgraduate work at all? Um, you may be familiar with the quote, academic politics is the most vicious and bitter form of politics because the stakes are so low. <laughs> uh, but, but it's not quite that simple, right? What we're really seeing there is what I call premature maturity. The desire to appear more grown up than you actually are. Anybody who's ever known or been an adolescent is familiar with this. You can't bear to be seen as immature, and so you put on the airs of maturity. And in doing so, you imitate what you see as what mature people do without really understanding them or understanding why, and probably without noticing some of the less obvious things that mature people do. And that certainly characterized uh, a lot of the early history of software engineering. And that resulted in the caricature that I've talked about. Here I'm going to um, show uh, some quotations that express the caricature of engineering. And I think most of you will find them, if you're not familiar with the exact quotations, you'll at least have heard things like them. And uh, they'll be very familiar with you in terms of the picture of engineering that they present. And I will contrast each one with um, uh, descriptions from real engineers or researchers into the history of engineering about what real engineering is like. <coughs> I apologize for coughing in the microphones. I've been sick most of the week. Um, just two years ago, Bruce Eckel who's a very smart software developer, and I think he actually knows better than this, but was just a little careless with his words. But nevertheless, he said this uh, in a blog post, and so I get to pick on him about it. And uh, I do think it reflects the attitude that a lot of developers have. He wrote, programming is not some kind of engineering, the sneer is almost palpable there, uh, where all we have to do is put something in one end and turn the crank. How many of you actually have a, a formal engineering background in another engineering field? Anybody? A few. Is there any kind of engineering where you just put something in one end and turn the crank? Another example of this same kind of misconception um, is the rational design process that was described in a 1986 paper by David Parnas. Um, in fairness, Parnas doesn't deserve the blame for all of this because he was basing it on something called the rational model of decision making, which uh, comes from a, a Herbert Simon book in 1969 called The Sciences of the Artificial. Um, but the rational design process that Parnas describes is uh, you first establish and document requirements, and then you design and document the module structure, and then you design and document the module interfaces, and then you design and document the uses hierarchy. And then you design and document the module internal structures. And finally, you write programs and maintain. Now that seems ridiculous when applied to software, but most of us, if we're honest, would say that at some point at least, we had the view in mind that that's kind of what an engineering process looks like. Design, 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 and then finally go build the thing. Um, Eugene Ferguson, in his wonderful book, Engineering and the Mind's Eye, uh, paints a more realistic picture of the engineer. The conversion of an idea to an artifact which engages both the designer and the maker is a complex and subtle process that will be, always be far closer to art than to science. I'm going to pick on David Parnas a little bit more. Uh, a few years ago in a talk I heard him give, he said, in engineering, people design through documentation. And certainly in engineering, documents are important as a record of the design. But the implication here is that that is uh, an essential part of the process of design. 
Going back to Ferguson again, although the drawings appear to be exact and unequivocal, their precision conceals many informal choices, inarticulate judgments, acts of intuition, and assumptions about the way the world works. <coughs> it's clear from looking at the early history of software engineering that uh, much of it was modeled on uh, uh, looking at particular engineering disciplines, and in particular, the oldest, most well-known, and arguably the most different from software development, structural engineering. And structural engineering does uh, have a strong bias towards what's known as the defined process model. The defined process control model requires that every piece of work be completely understood. A defined process can be started and allowed to run until completion with the same results every time. That certainly fits our view of how, for example, bridges are built. And um, it fits quite well the software processes that came out of the software engineering field. But the notion of process control models was originated by some chemical engineering researchers who, uh, when they learned that software development was heavily biased towards, uh, that software engineering was heavily biased towards this kind of process control model, uh, were amused, to say the least. Because chemical engineering, a well-understood, mature branch of engineering, uh, is in fact heavily biased toward the opposite end of the continuum, which is the empirical process control model which provides and exercises control through frequent inspection and adaptation for processes that are imperfectly defined and generate unpredictable and unrepeatable outputs. That certainly seems much more appropriate for software development. I mentioned earlier the 1996 conference on the history of software engineering, and in that, the proceedings of that conference, uh, I came across this diagram uh, which I think describes the view that many people have in the early days of some field. <coughs> um, we start with people producing things and others people trying to, to produce at a slightly higher level that bring notions of craft into the mix. And eventually this becomes commercial and profitable, money gets into the picture, and at that point it becomes necessary to bring in science. And once we take all of that stuff that we learned and base it on science, uh, then we end up with something mature and respectable called professional engineering. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, Nick Morgan tweeted the following. I've invented a new term, parasitic credibility, where certain fields attempt to link themselves to science in order to sound more real. Um, that is going on today, actually. Uh, if you're familiar, if you're interested in this at all, you may be familiar with uh, CEMAT, uh, an uh, a group called Software Engineering Method and Theory, uh, originated by Ivor Jacobson, uh, and dedicated to the proposition that uh, software engineering must be based on sound scientific theory, uh, or else, obviously, it's no good. But um, that has never really been the view of engineering, and uh, even even outside of such a young discipline as software development, uh, that notion is very contentious in the engineering field at large. Um, Fred Brooks, uh, when he was an engineering student in the 50s at Harvard, um, uh, in, in his book, The Design of Design, Brooks recommend, reminiscence, uh, pardon me, reminisces about his days at Harvard as an engineering student. At the, at the time, the dean of engineering at Harvard was um, John Van Vleck, who was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And Brooks says, uh, Van Vleck was very concerned that the practice of engineering be put on a firmer scientific basis. Note that Van Vleck was a physicist, not an engineer. He led a vigorous shift of American engineering education away from design toward applied science. The pendulum sp swung too far, reaction set in, and the teaching of design has been contentious ever since. This struggle goes back even farther. In 1923, uh, aeronautical engineer J.D. North, in an address to the Royal Aeronautical Society, 
uh, got a bit angry and said, airplanes are not designed by science, but by art, in spite of some pretense and humbug to the contrary. There is a big gap between scientific research and the engineering product, which has to be bridged by the art of the engineer. And finally, uh, another aeronautical engineer, Walter Vincenti, in his great book, What Engineers Know and How They Know It, points out that engineers, not just software developers, frequently have to make decisions of great practical importance in the face of incomplete and uncertain knowledge. Now here's something I've heard many times about software engineering uh, and the immature way we go about things in our field. You don't know it's right if you don't have the math to prove it. Uh, I haven't been able to find a good reference in software engineering literature that puts it quite this succinctly. If anybody comes across one, I'd appreciate hearing about it. But I know I've read this and I know I've been told this in various discussions many times, that real engineers use math to prove their assertions. But in engineering, although math is used quite heavily, it doesn't have the role that non-engineers often think it does. Um, going back to Eugene Ferguson's book again, structural analyses, indeed any engineering calculations, must be employed with caution and judgment because mathematical models are always less complex than actual structures, processes, or machines. The 19th century railroad bridge engineer, Arthur Mellon Wellington, had a, a nice way of saying this, and uh, uh, I've, I've edited his quote a little bit because he wrote in a sort of flowery Victorian English that's a bit hard to see through in these days. So I sort of tightened it up and made it more modern, but this is the gist of what he said. Engineering is not the art of constructing. It is rather the art of not constructing, or it is the art of doing well with one dollar what any bungler can do with two. So I mentioned that mathematics and, and formalism, formal analysis in engineering doesn't really have the role that we thought, that, that we often think it does. So let's explore what role it does have. Um, uh, I know it wasn't uh, big at the time, and the UK doesn't have the, the uh, newspaper comics culture that the US had, but um, uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes. Um, as a father, uh, I've modeled myself on Calvin's father. Uh, in that, uh, when my kids ask me some question about how the world works, I like to invent comical and highly improbable answers uh, and deliver them with a straight face and see what they say. And one of my favorite Calvin and Hobbes comic strips has Calvin asking, how do they know the load limit on bridges, Dad? There's 10 tons. And Dad cheerfully says, well, they drive bigger and bigger trucks over the bridge until it breaks. And then, they weigh the last truck and rebuild the bridge. <laughs> Calvin thinks this is perfectly reasonable. <laughs> Why is that funny? Like Joe in the last talk, this is not a... It's so unreasonable. It's, so unreasonable. it's ridiculous. Nobody would ever do that. How many of you have seen the video where the Boeing engineers test the wings of a 777 to the breaking point? Anybody seen that? If you haven't seen it, it's worth seeking out. Uh, a, because it'll make you feel very safe riding in a 777. Um, B, because it's just a remarkable uh, picture, glimpse, into how engineering is done. Um, they put this thing in a giant hangar attach winches to the ceiling and attach the ropes to brackets on the end of the wings and they start ratcheting the winches up until both wings break. And when they break, all the engineers get huge grins on their face and start slapping themselves on the back and rejoice. <laughs> My question for you is why? Anybody have any ideas? What was that? Because they predicted that, yes. 
because it happened at the exact moment they predicted. If math proves everything, why is that reason for rejoicing? Because they weren't sure. Models are always approximations of reality. They are not reality. So then, why are the models used? Mathematical modeling was introduced to engineering as a cost-saving measure. Because in order to build a bridge, just to take the, the usual example, and be sure that it's safe, in the absence of good mathematical models, you have two choices. One, the Calvin and Hobbes approach of actually build a full-scale prototype and test, uh, maybe multiple times if your first one didn't work as well as you hoped, or really over-engineer the thing. And even in the face of models, you have to over-engineer things because you have to over-engineer to account for the margins of error in your models. The reason mathematical modeling was introduced is that when you're working with physical materials, especially at a large scale, building prototypes and testing them is very expensive. And so we can use math to allow us to instead test models in the mathematical sense uh, and, and save ourselves the effort and cost and time of having to go build the real thing. And even in the face of uh, models, um, both failure and over-engineering happen. A good example is right around the corner from us here in Edinburgh. In 1879, the Tay Bridge, not far away from here, collapsed in a famous engineering disaster that the high girder portion there in the middle in a storm collapsed while a train was going across it and cost 75 lives. At the time of that disaster, another bridge was already in the planning stages over the Firth of Forth. And uh, as a reaction to uh, the Tay Bridge disaster, the fourth bridge design was changed to be much safer and more importantly to look much safer. The fourth bridge was the first major cantilever steel bridge uh, of its size ever built. And the design is simple radically different from the Tay Bridge, and really over-engineered for both engineering purposes and also for public relations purposes. I don't mean that as a criticism. I think that was exactly the appropriate thing to do, and I love this bridge, and I think it's beautiful. But um, this began a 30 year, roughly 30-year process of trying to better understand the statics and the physical theory behind cantilever steel bridges like this and build more accurate mathematical models of them. Why was accuracy important? Because it reduced the need to over-engineer and therefore it reduced the materials that would be involved and the cost of the bridges and so forth. And um, this is the fourth bridge still, just another view of it. Um, this 30-year process uh, resulted in thinner and lighter and less heavily over-engineered bridges uh, being built around the world over that period until the very light and airy Quebec Bridge collapsed. Also with great loss of life. After the Qu Quebec Bridge collapsed in 1907, um, those were sort of viewed as unsafe, so people started building big suspension bridges instead. And the cycle repeated itself. Uh, big, heavy-looking, over-engineered suspension bridges gradually getting lighter and airier until, of course, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge uh, ended the era of great suspension bridges. Um, and in the case of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, uh, the failure can be directly traced to a flawed mathematical model. <laughs> 
which was widely perceived as the best mathematical model of suspension bridges at the time. I went looking for definitions of engineering that predate software engineering. And uh, my favorite one in one sense is uh, this one from the Institution of Civil Engineers in 1828. Engineering is the art of directing the great sources of power in nature for the use and convenience of man. Which I like, but that's a bit colonialist, I think. So um, a more recent one from the Structural Engineers Association is structural engineering is the science and art of designing and making with economy and elegance structures so that they can safely resist the forces to which they may be subjected. I want you to notice the tensions in this definition. Engineering is a science and an art. It involves creativity, blind alleys, uh, exploration, discovery, as much as it involves merely applying the findings of science. It involves designing and making. Engineers don't just build documents and hand them off to people to build uh, the artifacts. They're involved in the making of the things they design and the, the, the fabrication facilities. Uh, good, good structural engineers have hard hats in their offices because they go to visit the construction site and talk with the workers and learn about new problems that were encountered during the construction of building or whatever. With economy and elegance, cost is always an object, a big object in engineering. Our job is not just to build something, but to build something in the most affordable way possible, balancing uh, economy and elegance and robustness. Another thing we learned from looking at real engineering disciplines is that different engineering disciplines are very different. When you look at structural engineering or electrical or mechanical or industrial engineering or chemical engineering, you learn that they use different materials, employ different physical effects, and deal with different forces. They work with different degrees of complexity in terms of the requirements, the, the designs themselves, the processes that they use, and the artifacts that are the eventual goal. The different engineering disciplines have a varied degree of reliance on formal modeling as opposed to experimentation and prototyping and testing. Structural engineers don't build a lot of physical model bridges. But electrical engineers sure build a lot of breadboards and, and, and prototypes and things like that. Ask your friendly neighborhood aeronautical engineer uh, how much math he would do if building and testing a prototype of his design were instantaneous and free. The answer is probably not none, but it's a lot less than they do now. And finally, they have a varied reliance and use of defined versus empirical processes. So if we understand what real engineering is like and we try to apply that to what we as software practitioners know of the software development field, what would we end up with? Well, first of all, I'm going to take that Structural Engineers Association definition of engineering and modify it a little bit to, to be kind of my view of the definition of software engineering which is the science and art of designing and making with economy and elegance systems so that they readily adapt to the situations to which they may be subject, subjected. And this incorporates the idea that, that one of the great benefits of software is that it's soft. The goal isn't to resist forces. The goal is to adapt to change. Other than that, though, I think the structural engineer's definition is a very good one. We know that software engineering can be expected to be very different from other engineering disciplines. So we should not, when we're done, end up with a look-alike of structural engineering or a caricature of some other engineering discipline that we understand or think we understand. Software engineering was uh, based on an analogy, on drawing an analogy with large-scale uh, physical engineering disciplines. And that analogy goes something like this. You have engineers, and they sit in their white shirts and ties, and they produce designs. 
And those designs are then handed to laborers who use the designs to go and build the finished product. By analogy then, if we want to view software development in the same way and try to learn from uh, engineering disciplines about how we should build software, uh, let's look, what, look at what the analogy looks like. So we have software engineers, uh, the same guy, just you know, retrained, um, and they produce a design which is then given to some laborers in their cubicles which produce the finished product. And it's hard to look, once you've sort of seen it laid out this way, it's hard to look at any of the discussions of software engineering between 1969 and the mid-90s without seeing this analogy just blaring loud and clear through every assumption that is being made. But in 1992, I believe, um, a gentleman named Jack Reeves uh, realized that this, I, this analogy is totally wrong. And he wrote a paper called What is Software Design and published it in the C++ Report, which is why uh, not as many of you as should have have ever heard of it. Um, where he said, you know, this analogy is totally wrong because it misses some fundamental things about software development. Uh, this is what the analogy you would draw if you didn't know anything about software development. But um, if you're a programmer, you know how things go, you know this is wrong. And, and the first problem is we've never been able to figure out a way of expressing a software design that, uh, in, in any kind of an economical way, that then programmers can take and reliably turn into working software. And so maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe we should just try to re change our view of what a software design is. In fact, Reeves said, the programmers are the engineers of software. And this thing over here, the source code, that's not the finished artifact. That's not what our customers are paying us for. Our customers are paying us to produce working software that's installed on machines, not files of ASCII text sitting on disk somewhere. In fact, that source code is the design of our software. Maybe not all of it. It still helps to have diagrams sometimes that are, are the high-level view of the design, but the detailed design, how it's actually supposed to work, is the source code. So what, what does that make the laborers? What corresponds to the laborers in this world? Compilers and programming language implementations. And the finished artifact is working solutions running on machines that customers can use. Once you see the analogy this way, everything changes. What's the most expensive part of the top row? Construction. Construction. What's the cheapest part of the bottom row? Construction. Construction. And that upside-down economics changes everything about what we should do. And any field that earns the title of software engineering, any way of doing things that earns the title of software engineering, needs to take that fundamental fact into account. That for us, building a prototype of our design is effectively instantaneous and free. And furthermore, when Reeves wrote his paper, uh, testing that prototype was still quite an expensive proposition, although nowhere near as expensive as testing a bridge. But in the years since 1992, we've learned an awful lot about reducing the cost of repetitive testing of our designs, haven't we? And so by far, the most expensive part of our field is the designing itself to such a great degree that it dwarfs everything else and makes it look insignificant. Another point, I'll point I will point out is that uh, although we are often criticized for not having mathematical rigor in our field, that source code is math. Even if our programming languages aren't rigorously specified using denotational semantics or some other formal mechanism, and that's Ruby, so it certainly is not, uh, that is a formal language with rigid semantics. 
We use math every day. Our math does real work for us. Our math is executable. And this was understood even as far back as the 1968 NATO Software Conference, a Software Engineering Conference. In that conference, Friedrich Bauer said, what is needed is not classical mathematics, but mathematics nevertheless. And Edsger Dijkstra, who went on to have, uh, be a strong proponent of formal mathematical software proofs, still started things off by saying, our basic tools are mathematical in nature. One more thing. Um, in that picture back here, where's the model? Oops, that's the wrong, wrong version. Where's the model? Where's our model? Um, it's partly in our heads, but that's the same is true of engineering, right? The expression of the model is also in the source code. And, and the, the ease of seeing the model of the system in the source code is one uh, measure of the quality of the design itself. Where's our document? Engineers use models, they use math, they use documents. Where's our document? In the source code. I mentioned earlier that um, Parnas says that engineers design through documents. And he has proposed a documentation notation called tabular mathematical expressions for expressing requirements and designs. And um, it would be unfair for me to show you this next example without saying that this is a grossly oversimplified example of a tabular mathematical expression. But nevertheless, this gets the idea across. This is uh, a, a very simplified example of one of Parnas's tabular mathematical expressions because he views, he, he thinks we need to have documents. Um, I'll show you some other documents that actually uh, express the same requirement in a different way. Here's one. Oops. Push the wrong button. I'm not used to working without my remote. Here's one. Here's another. Here's another. And there's another, which actually starts to look quite a bit like Parnas' original. We have a, a test unit test case and an RSpec uh, example and a cucumber scenario and a fitness fixture. What's different about these documents as opposed to Parnas's document? They're executable. They can execute and verify themselves. They're documents, but they're not merely documents. Um, if you ran each of these, you would find that there was an error. That error is there intentionally to point out the fact that uh, it would be much harder to figure out that that one has an error. Finally, um, empirical versus uh, defined processes. This is a diagram of the 12 or 13, as I define them, original practices of extreme programming, and the dependencies between them <coughs> that Kent Beck documents in his book, uh, Extreme Programming Explained. Um, and, and those dependencies take the form, you know, there's a whole chapter in his book that says, you know, uh, uh, unit testing couldn't possibly work because X, Y, and Z, it has these flaws. And that would be true, except that these other practices, continuous integration and collective ownership and 40 hour week and pair programming and refactoring and so forth, backfill for that and help make up for its flaws. There's a redundancy in this process. And uh, spurred on by a comment from Dave Thomas, I started wondering, uh, he, he said, you know, if you built a, a software design that, that was that tightly coupled, you'd be fired. And 
I said, you know, that, he has a point, but that doesn't seem right to me. So I started looking for deeper structure there. And it turns out that most of those um, uh, dependencies can be understood this way. You can lay those practices out, uh, most of them. Uh, some of the practices are really just standards. The ones that are actual practices. You can lay it out along a line, and uh, you can lay them out according to the scale of artifact, the scale of decision that they are dealing with when you practice them. When you're pair programming, you're dealing mostly at the level of statements and methods. And unit tests work mostly at the level of methods and classes and interfaces. And all the way up to short releases are there to help you validate that you're producing the right solution for the customer's problem. And interestingly enough, you can remap that line to the scale of time on which those practices work. Pair programming works at the level of seconds and, and sometimes minutes. Unit testing works uh, at the level of minutes. Um, uh, On-site customer works at the level of hours, where you, you go back and forth with them discussing details of requirements and so forth, all the way up to short releases taking several weeks or months, uh, in many cases, to, to go from release to release. Um, this is practically the definition of an empirical process for software. It gains feedback about every decision that's made at every stage at the most rapid scale, uh, at, at the smallest time scale that's economically practical to gain feedback about that kind of decision. It's costly to gain feedback about big decisions, so we don't do that quite as often. But we still do it as fast as possible. But it's very cheap to gain feedback about small decisions, so we do that every few seconds. Constantly gaining feedback and adjusting uh, just like an empirical process should. Agile software development has been accused of being uh, ad hoc and sloppy and messy, but in fact, I think it's a great depiction of what an engineering process for software ought to be. So I'm a little over time. I'm going to finish very quickly. Um, I talked about software engineering um, suffering from premature maturity. What will it look like when we really grow up? We won't rely on math. We won't rely on models. We won't rely, we won't, won't rely on documents. And we certainly won't rely on copying other disciplines without understanding them. Instead, we'll learn from practitioners in our field about what works and what doesn't work. We'll bias towards empirical processes because that's more appropriate for such a complex field where so much is unknown. We'll encourage continued innovation in those processes. I don't think XP or Agile is the be-all, end-all. I still think we have a lot to learn. And we will make sure that we call what works engineering and stop using that term for things that don't work. Thank you.